Jim, thank you so much for those kind words. And I want to uh, thank the association for the invitation uh, to come here, and particularly for the honor of uh, delivering uh, a lecture series in Dan Rose's uh, uh, name. Uh, the Roses have been good friends for many years now, and uh, it's, uh, it's really great uh, to be able to come and uh, talk to you uh, on an occasion which they made possible. Now, I was um, asked to talk about living with Putin's Russia. And, you know, the news from Russia in so many ways, what we've been reading over the past particularly year and a half, two years, has uh, makes it seem as if everything is really going downhill very fast. We have had the occasion of gas prom uh, for a day and a half or so, uh, reducing the gas supplies uh, supposedly to Ukraine, but of course the Ukrainians took what they wanted out of what passed and the e Europeans ended up a little short. Uh, not enough to do any great damage and uh, the whole thing was uh, papered over in uh, I think within three days, but still it raised the question of whether Russia can be uh, in the future a completely reliable supplier of energy. And since Russia has the largest uh, natural gas reserves in the world and some of the largest oil reserves, uh, this is obviously a matter of concern. And then, of course, for many years now, ever since they renewed the war in uh, 1999 uh, against Chechnya, uh, the atrocities there, the problems there have been an intermittent uh, a matter for, of concern uh, and uh, so on. And then of course we had the whole Khodorkovsky affair and the backdoor renationalization of the Yukos which uh, Khodorkovsky had built into probably their most efficient um, certainly uh, oil uh, producing firm and uh, potentially if he had, was, had been able to go through one of the mergers he had in mind, I think they would have been the third or fourth largest uh, international. Uh, the rule of law and uh, particularly the procedural aspects, protections, were simply rolled over and it made it clear that in a pinch the, uh, the Kremlin does control the courts uh, and they have not made as much progress as people had hoped in separating uh, the judicial system from the political authorities. And then for several years now, uh, the electronic media in particular have been under pressure, uh, at least in two areas. Uh, they really are not able in their, uh, um, particularly in the national television, to criticize the president. And uh, coverage of the war in Chechnya uh, has been kept uh, very limited and hardly at all, particularly anything that could cause concern. Uh, then we had about two years ago, a little less than two years ago, a couple of constitutional changes that seemed to be backtracking. Uh, instead of electing their governors uh, of their, uh, what they call the subjects of the federation, we would call them states, uh, they now are going to be uh, appointed by uh, the president uh, with, to be sure, the approval of the elected legislatures, but nevertheless appointed rather than elected. And uh, the, they also abolished the constituencies for election of members of the Duma, the legislature, uh, uh, for a proportional representation. Earlier, half the members had been uh, seated by proportional representation, giving, in effect, the, the parties uh, uh, a choice over who uh, gets seated, uh, provided the parties get more than 5% of the vote, there's a certain threshold they have to pass, and half previously had constituencies, like our congressmen have constituencies. Now, uh, there won't be constituencies in the future, but everybody will be elected on a party list. Um, then, uh, of course, we had the case of their uh, uh, interference in elections in Georgia and Ukraine, uh, interference that was overcome eventually uh, with a, a different result, but nevertheless the interference was there and um, this raised questions about how far they would go in trying to reassert authority over uh, some of the independent countries that came out of the Soviet Union. 
Then fairly recently, they've passed a new law on foreign-funded non-governmental organizations, which gives them the potential to put much more pressure on those, particularly those that are, you might say, in the, in the uh, democracy uh, building area. The, um, now, so far, I think uh, we haven't seen any strong action against any of the important ones, but clearly uh, it gives them authority if they choose uh, to come in and create considerable difficulties. And to make matters worse in general, uh, corruption seems to be increasing rather than decreasing. Uh, the Transparency International between 2004 and 2005 move Russia from 90th place in the world to uh, well <laughs> there goes there goes the uh, energy supply I suppose <laughs> well they moved them from 90th place to uh, to uh, I think well, here we go now I can actually read the number to 100 now here we go again 90th place to 125th place. Now that's out of 159 countries, but it places them there alongside Nigeria and Sierra Leone uh, in terms of the amount of corruption. Now, these things which we've all read about, and obviously there are others I could mention, although I think these are the principal ones that have caused concern, we're hearing increasingly voices that we should do something about this. We hear them in Congress. I think uh, Congressman Lantos was proposing at one point that we uh, simply abolish the group of eight and go back to the group of seven. Uh, and uh, uh, in the press, the Washington Post had a, a very strong editorial just about 10 days ago about uh, a disappointment with Russia and something had to be done about that. And even uh, the task force that uh, was organized by the Council on Foreign Relations came out with a report uh, making uh, similar recommendations, fairly mildly, but nevertheless the idea that, uh, and I think they actually used phrases such as backtracking on democracy. Well, it's pretty clear that the trends we see, if they continue, are going to result in, I would say, an illiberal autocracy uh, uh, in Russia. Nevertheless, one has to ask, are these events the whole story, or are they just part of it? Will they continue? You know, is this a trend that's going to continue out there for a long time? And finally, assuming what the story is, and I'll say a little more about that, uh, is any of this of really direct interest to the United States? Now, first of all, let's is what I have enumerated the whole story? Uh, no, I think is the short answer. There is another side of the coin, and particularly if you look at it from the standpoint of the average Russian citizen. Um, now, you take the whole Gazprom thing. I think that, uh, yes, it was outrageous uh, for uh, Russia to demand that Ukraine um, start paying something closer to market prices for the gas. Uh, I mean, other countries don't do that, and other firms don't do that. Uh, and uh, uh, they were, after all, supplying gas to Ukraine for, uh, I think, uh, something like one-sixth, maybe one-eighth of what they supplied to Western Europe. Obviously, I'm speaking with a certain irony here. It was really not the point that uh, Ukraine and others, including Russia, shouldn't start bringing their domestic prices up to world market prices for a whole lot of reasons. But it was the way it was done, and it did seem as if, you know, they would for political reasons, because they didn't like what had happened in the earlier Ukrainian elections, putting the pressure on Ukraine. Um, actually, the story is much more complicated than that, but the bottom line, as far as the West was concerned, is it didn't really damage anybody except Russia's reputation and uh, is probably going to make it harder for Russia to negotiate the sort of terms it wants on some future deals because they're going to have to give, I think, pretty strong assurances that this sort of thing won't happen again. The fact is Russia needs the money, uh, Europe needs the gas, 
and uh, and on the whole, uh, they have not yet done anything that really seriously uh, 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 disrupted supplies. Behind this whole thing, however, was a story that very little was told about it, because this whole operation is uh, is actually run to the benefit of a very shadowy corporation. I think it's, uh, uh, I, I believe it's uh, incorporated in Vienna. Nobody knows quite who the owners are. Uh, and it's called Ros uh, Uk Ernergo. And we, what we have here behind this is really a struggle between oligarchs uh, in both Russia and Ukraine and over such things as control of pipelines and, and other things. Uh, and they worked out a temporary deal. They'll be working on this later. Uh, but it was not, in any sense, just simply a simple a political action in regard to Ukraine. Now, uh, I don't say that I think it was a good thing to do. But on the whole, I think it was more damaging to Russia than anybody else. Uh, second, the Ukrainian election. Well, yes. They made their preference very, very clear. They probably put in a lot of, of, of money in that. And, of course, the election was fraudulent. You had the Orange Revolution, the, the uh, crowds uh, in, in the square and blocking the government until they redid the election. Now, this was played in the West as if it was pro-Western Ukrainians against pro-Russian Ukrainians or, or really. Now, uh, and there was some of that. There's no question. But uh, and when the election was redone and more fairly, uh, Mr. Yushchenko won. But even in that election, the other fellow got nearly 44 percent. And his support is really concentrated in eastern Ukraine. The fact is, Ukraine is politically divided very seriously. And the reason Yushchenko was able to win, he put together really a coalition including one of the, uh, I would say, one of the oligarchic groups uh, led by uh, 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 Mrs. Tymoshenko. And within a few months, that coalition broke up totally. And she was fired as, foreign minister, as, pri as prime minister uh, because over issues of corruption in the Ukrainian government. The most recent election has Yushchin coming in third, Tymoshenko second, and Yanukovych's party, the one who lost, coming in with the largest number of deputies. This situation is much more complicated. And, you know, the idea that suddenly Ukraine is, is, a, is a viable candidate either for NATO membership or EU membership is, frankly, pretty absurd. Uh, but it was often played as if this was the major issue there. A lot, uh, much more complicated than that. Or take Chechnya. Is that a case of national liberation struggle uh, that the Russians have brutally put down? Well, they've certainly been brutal. I mean, they came into Chechnya. Well, just about the way we went into Fallujah. The main difference is Chechnya is part of Russia and Fallujah is not part of the United States. It was an armed rebellion uh, by a government which had no authority to claim independence because they never had an election. And you've had throughout fights between various Chechen factions. And yes, Al-Qaeda has infiltrated the group. And the group has been guilty of some very horrible uh, 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 terrorist acts, not only in Chechnya, but outside Chechnya in other parts of Russia. Russia has not handled it well. It has been brutal. It's a terrible situation. But again, it's one that very hard to see a complete end to it because it's not simply a case that if Russia would leave Chechnya alone and let them have their independence, everything would be okay. They tried that. They tried that for four years. And Chechnya at that time became a center of crime, kidnapping, increasing activity by Al-Qaeda, and then actually an invasion of some of the neighboring areas. No government is going to put up with that, uh, or should. And as I say, they had certainly haven't handled it well, but the fact is that it's not the open and shut case that many people make it. Let's take the media. Oh, yes, it is too bad. Uh, and I think it's not in Russia's interest, uh, the sort of controls they have on it. But this is in no sense like the controls the Soviet Union had. Often I think the commentators who look at Russia today have either forgotten or don't know what the situation was under the Soviet Union. 
There, you didn't write anything in the press unless you were told to, and you were told what to write. And, and there were vast areas that just weren't covered at all. That's one point. The second point is that the Russian press was never freer before or since than it was the last year of the Soviet Union, at a time still when all the media was state-owned, but Gorbachev stopped controlling it. And all right, through the 90s, it became privately owned. They became uh, the paws of the oligarchs, uh, most of the media. And they were free, yes. But if they started muckraking, if they started going after criminal gangs, you'd get shot. I think over uh, nearly 50 journalists in the 90s were killed uh, on contract assassinations. And I don't believe a single one of those was solved. So is, are they backtracking on a free press? Or is it a case that they're, they're, they're struggling with a situation where they haven't really had a free press uh, and, and um, uh, the, the problems are different? So many of the things we hear about, somehow I, I think that if we look at the whole story, you wouldn't say they were good events, but they're not quite as bad, maybe not nearly as bad sometimes as they're said to be. But in addition, there have been a whole series of undoubtedly positive developments. There's been a steady improvement of economic performance and a rise in the standard of living since 1998 when they had the financial collapse. Uh, you know, industrial production has been growing between 7, 8, and 9 percent. It'll vary each year, almost every year since then. Government finances are not only in a favorable balance, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they have a very uh, um, they have a, not just a balanced budget, they, uh, they have a budget which uh, takes in more than it spends. And the balance of payments with the outside world is very favorable. Um, they have a stable currency. The, uh, you know, uh, the, the ruble has stayed stable against the dollar. Uh, ever since uh, they reformed it after 1998, uh, and uh, whereas the dollar has uh, uh, sank, you know, vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis the euro, uh, the rule tended to say somewhere in between the dollar and the euro, stable for the, really the first time since they had a convertible currency. They're paying their debts ahead of time. They now have some of the smaller debts of a large country in the world at a time where the United States has become the world's largest debtor. Uh, the, the average citizen sees a degree of stability and predictability about their lives that they didn't have before. Putin's popularity is high. He won two elections uh, without any widespread fraud that anybody could determine by 70 percent. And the polls, and they are run uh, now on scientific basis, show he's running still about 70 percent uh, popularity. Now, if you go to intellectuals in Moscow or St. Petersburg, you hear nothing but complaints. They have complete freedom of, of speech about this, and nobody puts them in jail, as, as would have happened back in the Soviet period. Um, and even if there has been backtracking in a number of formal senses, uh, some of the things that I mentioned, it's not back to the USSR. In fact, I think one of the basic fallacies when in the backtracking charge, and you find this very clearly in the Council on Foreign Relations uh, 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 report uh, recently, is the assumption that Russia had a democracy in the 90s and is regressing. But the Russia of, of the 1990s was not a democratic country in any real sense. It was, it was beset by a significant degree of anarchy. Even the word democracy got a bad name because they called what they were doing democracy, but it wasn't. And I'm reminded, uh, you know, in 1991, in that last year of the Soviet Union, we had a, an American ship visit uh, um, Sevastopol. First time since World War II. And, uh, of course, Rebecca and I went down with members of our staff to greet uh, the ship. It was a missile cruiser. And one of the Soviet admirals took us on a tour of the, uh, of the Crimean Peninsula, and we ended up at Yalta. And the mayor met us, and we were walking along the waterfront, see seeing the city. And I noticed there was a sign over at the waterfront uh, in, in an area. There was one sign where people were swimming. There was another sign saying, dangerous, no swimming. 
And there must have been 20 people there swimming. And I asked the mayor, I said, you know, don't you enforce your safety rules? And he said, you know, we have democracy now. We can't tell people what to do. <laughs> no? And that's what, when you ask a Russian now in the polls, do you want democracy? You'll find that probably 60% will say no. But if you ask them, do you want freedom of the speech? Do you want to elect your people? Do you want freedom to travel? All of these good things, it's 80, 90 percent yes. But if you just look at the poll on democracy, you know, you, and there have been articles, including by scholars, say, well, Russians really don't want democracy. They're not fit for it. Look at what these polls say. You've got to look behind it and see what they mean when they say it. Now, I see the time is running on, but I, I do want to look briefly at the past uh, because I think that one of the problems... Uh, often is that particularly we Americans we we almost we live in the present we think about the future and and you know we want to put the past behind us if they're uh, uh, usually and and not just dwell on it but that means you know we often forget important things at other people's perceptions first of all we shouldn't forget that it was Russia that dealt the Soviet Union its final blow I can elaborate on that if you wish but in fact if you know, the elected Russian president hadn't ganged up with the, uh, with the leader of Belarus and Ukraine to dissolve the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, we would have had a Soviet Union uh, longer than, uh, uh, than we did. In the 90s, Russia really went through three profound revolutions, uh, you know, of a magnitude that no other country has had to face. The economy from a completely state-controlled economy where private property and the means of production was considered illegal and immoral to a market economy with widespread private property. They went through a total uh, 180 degrees in their political system from a communist dictatorship where the whole country was run from behind the scenes the way a criminal organization might run a city or, or, or part of one. Uh, and that's the way the Communist Party ruled the Soviet Union to one that at least is a representative democracy on paper. Uh, but most of all, I think the Russians were going through a profound doubt about what it means to be Russian. Uh, you know, uh, did they lose an empire and therefore are sort of at the bottom of the heap? Or, you know, did they rid themselves of possessions uh, which were, were actually drains on them? Uh, where, and, and as a matter of fact, most Russians initially were very happy to get rid of Central Asia, for example. They considered, you know, these to be a drain. Uh, so, you know, and I think the Russians are still trying to sort this out. Yeltsin even set up a commission to try to, you know, uh, to decide what sort of the, the national meaning of Russia is. Well, obviously, you can't do this with committees and uh, commissions. It, it works out in life uh, and with experience. But, you know, they call the 90s the democracy, and some outsiders did. But for most Russians, it was the law of the jungle. It was a criminal-ridden society at that time. It, re it, re it represented for them the flagrant theft, theft of state assets by a very small group of people who went overnight from people with no property to billionaires. And I don't mean in this case millionaires, billionaires. Uh, and uh, they had a media free of censorship but controlled by some of the oligarchs with journalists, as I pointed out, increasingly assassinated if they went after the local gangs. Now, of course, in this whole period of the last few years, uh, President Putin has concentrated more and more power in his hands, using energy receipts uh, to reassert his country's political power. This seems to be resented abroad but frankly, most Russians welcome it. Um, they do have at least the rudiments now, and more than the rudiments of a civil society. They have many of the freedoms that we were, they were, and we were seeking throughout the Soviet period: freedom to travel. Over eight million take their vacations abroad now. 
Uh, and uh, there's no restrictions on freedom to travel. Freedom of speech, as I've indicated, um, uh, although you can't criticize the president very severely on TV, you can in the press. There are plenty of anti-Putin books uh, circulated. If you talk to any taxi driver, uh, uh, you know, in Moscow or Petersburg, you have to get a long screed, you know, if you can understand his Russian about how bad Putin is as a president and so on. Uh, they, you know, uh, they have not lost all of these freedoms by any means. Um, and there's actually considerable press freedom. Uh, one of uh, our Russian friends who spends her winters in the States with her daughter who's married to an American and her summers in Moscow says, you know, I'm really better informed uh, on most matters of world politics by the Soviet media, by the Russian media, uh, than I am if I watch CNN. And certainly I'm better informed if I watch Fox. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, there, uh, yes, there are certain things that are missing, but it is not, you know, like it was in the Soviet media. But let me get to the United States and our, to the question is how much is this relevant to us as a country? Um, most of these are primarily domestic issues. Obviously some of them do have foreign policy implications. Uh, but um, the, if we look back to the basics, the security interests of both of our countries are very, very similar. Terrorism is a threat to both and more or less the same groups uh, are the enemies. We're both prone to natural disasters. Uh, they, uh, with their, uh, I would say, eroding infrastructure in many areas. I mean, uh, a New Orleans of some sort is, is almost waiting to happen. Uh, neither of us are a moon. We, we are both uh, face the problem of spreading epidemic diseases. Um, you know, whether in the next one will be bird flu uh, or whether it can be contained the way SARS does. It's hard to say, uh, but AIDS is a problem in both countries, and, and still we haven't found a way uh, really to cope with it adequately. Nuclear proliferation, the, the major threat to both of us. Uh, environmental change, it's going to affect us both. Uh, quite frankly, global warming may affect Russia more favorably than it does us. Uh, nevertheless, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good thing for any of us. Then, of course, we think of, we see today the rise of China and India. Now, that's not necessarily or automatically a threat to either of us if it's handled properly, but that presents problems, whether they're economic or whether they're political or military or security for both countries. And yet, Russia being closer to both is going to be more affected than the United States. It's certainly in both of our interests that that process of bringing, you know, of, of Chinese development, of Indian development, uh, be, uh, be peaceful and be, you know, integrated in, into uh, the world uh, system. Uh, our fundamental economic interests are basically consistent. Um, after all, we have for some time have quietly tried to encourage greater export of Russian energy uh, to reduce the total reliance on the Middle East. Uh, and um, uh, to the degree that Russia uh, supplies that, obviously it, it does tend to moderate prices um, and uh, at the same time it does uh, uh, diversify, uh, of course, sources of supply. Um, is an expansionist Russia a threat? Well, I would say look at the record. When they have tried to put, use too much muscle on their neighbors, they've normally failed. And they, they certainly haven't invaded another country uh, using direct military force. Um, there are there in our security issues, I think, some sleeping issues that neither government has given enough attention to, and that is our own nuclear weapons, the one in both countries. I think it is utterly, you know, it reaches almost the level of insanity that we both have nuclear weapons on alert. We say they're not in, aimed at each other, but why have them on alert? It's a dangerous situation, something that should have stopped 15 years ago. And somehow we're stuck with that. We're still, even with the reductions that will be made, each, each of, uh, of us are going to have, you know, over 2,000 uh, nuclear warheads. And for what? Again, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a long lecture in and of itself. Now, let me just say that when we're looking at U.S.-Russian relations, we also need to look back a little bit at recent history. And the fact is, if we look at it from the Russian standpoint, 
The U.S. in effect ignored most Russian interests in the 1990s and in their eyes tried to marginalize them. Uh, they would name a number of things such as NATO expansion, the bombing of Serbia over Kosovo, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and many are convinced that, well, we led them down the garden path. Actually, it wasn't really our fault, and all of this, I say, is their perception, not necessarily quite true. We led them down the garden path. If you would accept uh, 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 democratic institutions and a market economy, you're going to be living well. Instead, they faced economic collapse. Uh, and um, then they see the United States is competing for influence in what was once the Soviet Union. And they think this is very dangerous. Um, I don't know whether why we have a little trouble understanding that. We have never been, at least since President Monroe, very happy about foreigners uh, fiddling around in our hemisphere. Uh, and, um, and yet, uh, they have gone so far at times as actually approve uh, U.S. bases in Central Asia because we were going after a con enemy in Afghanistan. In the bilateral relationship, if you look through the 90s and even the early 2000s, Russia has made almost every concession that was made over issues that were uh, contentious between us. Uh, they, uh, they took two NATO expansions, including into the Baltic states in stride, uh, after having opposed them. Uh, they set still for the abolition of the ABM Treaty, which was one that until then was considered the rock bottom uh, agreement in our, uh, in our uh, security relationship, uh, the sort of the foundation agreement. Uh, even after Putin had offered to amend it so that we could work on missile defenses, and he offered a joint program. Uh, uh, which was turned down. Furthermore, the U.S., in their eyes, constantly moves the goalposts uh, and judges Russia's by standards, which we apply to nobody else, uh, and least of all to the United States itself. Um, well, where do, where do I come out on this? Let's get back to how do we live with this Russia that we see with all of these contradictions and, and some of them, uh, you know, seriously concerning, uh, we should be seriously concerned with some of the developments. First, I firmly believe that we should base our foreign policy and our relations with every country on our national interests and not on the compatibility or incompatibility of their internal political structure. Now, I would like to live in a world of democracies, um, but I think that the idea that somehow we can promote it by penalizing or uh, backsliding, as we put it, uh, and that uh, that brings you, uh, you know, that helps develop democracy, I find quite counterintuitive from my experience. Most people don't like to be told how they, uh, you know, what the institutions are appropriate to them, and uh, particularly if they look out and see that uh, they're being treated uh, differently from others. So it does seem to me that basically we should look at our uh, interests and, uh, and form our foreign policy on that basis. I think that President Putin, with all of his faults, understands that Russia is naturally a European power, though of course with important interests in Asia. And the reason this is important is he is not one of those who feels that Russia's future is making an alliance, say, with China or India or both of them against the United States and Western Europe. He knows that that's a chimera. It just can't, uh, it's not going to work. And uh, that's not his direction. Putin and his successors will use energy resources to regain a place in great power politics. But I don't know why this needs to threaten American national interests. As a matter of fact, to some degree, to the degree that they make us somewhat less dependent on the Middle East or on Venezuela or almost anybody else you can name or Iran uh, for oil, then it, it actually helps, at least in marginal ways. Um, should we worry about Russian imperialism? A lot of people do. Now, I think we did, do need to understand Putin's view of the Soviet Union, which is very widely shared, I think, in his country. And he has said on over uh, occasions, anybody who does not regret the collapse of the Soviet Union has no heart. Anybody who would try to reassemble it has no brain. 
Now, why, do, why, why is that? It's because the collapse of the Soviet Union coincided with the collapse of almost everything else from the average standpoint, and they're connected to. They were not, uh, it was not cause and effect, uh, you know, we can say in the abstract, but they felt that uh, in Russia, although Russia itself was the, initi it was the final initiator of that collapse. Um, I wrote in the book I wrote uh, 10 years ago about the breakup of the Soviet Union, an unreformed Russia will not have the strength for empire. A reformed Russia will not have the will. I think that is still true, and we're somewhere between an uh, uh, I would say a partially reformed Russia, which still does not have the strength for empire, nor even a desire for the old type of empire. Uh, and to the degree they get reformed, they w really won't have the will to do so. But uh, are they sensitive to what happens in their neighborhood? Of course they are. Is the United States sensitive about what happens in Cuba or Honduras? How have we acted? And sometimes I, you know, Russians will say, look, uh, we're sort of modeling our behavior on you, and if it's okay for you, why is it so bad for us? Um, I would say the Russian behavior really has mimicked U.S. behavior in the Caribbean and Central America, minus uninvited military interventions which we have been guilty of more than they, uh, uh, even in recent months. Russian democracy, would we worry about it? Well, should we worry about it? When I was ambassador in uh, those last couple of years of the Soviet Union, when people could speak very openly and ask questions openly, I was often asked, how long is it going to take for us to be a normal country? They would say normal country, they, but they meant what we mean by democracy, broadly speaking. And my answer was always at least two generations. I'll hold to that. Okay, it may take three. But even if it's two, they're about halfway through the first. And I'll tell you, they're much more than a quarter of a way between what they had in the Soviet Union and what we all would like to see them have. And if the Russians move in a more authoritative direction, Russians, not Americans, or Europeans, or Asians, will be the primary victims. And this is something we need to bear in mind, because when we make so much of their internal structure, the natural conclusion is we're doing it to gain an advantage over them, that it's more in our interest for them to be a democracy than it is in theirs. And that is precisely the opposite of what we need to convey. Um, the best way, in my opinion, to support democracy in other countries is by example. Russians feel strongly that we are not their nanny, and attempts to instruct them, or worse, pressure them, do more harm than good. And furthermore, we have zero leverage, because right now we need them more than they need us. You know, I've sometimes said, you know, I feel a little strange when Americans start talking about backsliding on democracy to a country that has a president that won two terms with 70% of the vote, which is running 70% in uh, the, the polls as far as approval of his own people. And we inaugurated a president who got fewer votes than his opponent. Uh, and in many ways uh, are arguing over issues uh, such as uh, uh, the war powers and whether the president really has to follow uh, the law by Congress. Um, you know, looking out at the world, frankly, some of the preaching about backsliding on Russian democracy strikes Russians, and not only Russians, as the grossest hypocrisy. And that's another reason that I find uh, it very distasteful. Let me just conclude by quoting a comment that George Kennan wrote in a foreign affairs article in 1951. Now, Kennan, I might say parenthetically, uh, you know, we in the government, we disagreed with a number of Kennan's advice. But in a very basic sense, Kennan determined U.S. post-war policy toward the Soviet Union because throughout it was containment, not liberation. It was an attempt to change Soviet behavior, 
not directly to uh, create regime change. Uh, and he had predicted, even from the 30s, that if we could contain Soviet expansionism, eventually the country, the system, would collapse because of internal uh, 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 contradictions and tensions. And that's exactly what happened. But in 1951, he wrote the following. If it should turn out to be the will of fate that freedom should come to Russia by erosion from despotism rather than by the violent upthrust of, liber upthrust of liberty, let us be able to say that our policy was such as to favor it and that we did not hamper it by preconception or impatience or despair. Thank you very much. I can. Uh, actually, I think I have to use this for the audience. Okay. I, uh, this one is uh, this one is for the camera, and I think that's for oh. the speaker. <laughs> okay. So we now have uh, about 15 minutes of questions. You weren't saying, by the way, that the 70% approval of Putin added to George Bush's 30 equals 100. <laughs> Sounds like uh, 103. <laughs> is it 33? Things <laughs> we listen to. Uh, I was just doing math when I was at my table. So I'm going to we're going to take questions. Please state your name, and of course, as usual, uh, questions, not uh, declarations. Yes, ma'am. My name is Sandy Schulte. I want to thank you for a wonderful, informative uh, lecture. You did not dance around the point. We're very concrete. Thank you. However, I you say that not, the Russians do not want the old-fashioned imperialism. I posit, and I'd like to get the response to the fact, that there's a new kind of, shall we call it, imperialism. Now we have countries that, are, that operate as, uh, as, as far as companies. They as, are not interested in, in taking over our whole They're interested in buying resources, what is really important in a country, in buying com companies that, are, that have lots of resources. Would you please respond to this, sir? Yeah, I think uh, that's right. And of course, th this is a very sensitive issue, not only in Russia, but in many other areas. Um, we are obviously sensitive. We, uh, we have told the Chinese they can't buy one of our oil companies. Uh, we know how it happened when the Dubai company wanted to uh, uh, buy the company that operates uh, uh, some of our ports. Uh, we place limits on uh, the degree to which there can be foreign investment in our airlines. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, we're sensitive to that. Other countries are too. And I think one of the things that Russia is trying to sort out, and it, it keeps an, they keep an saying they're going to announce uh, uh, their policy, but they haven't yet, is with natural resources and other uh, things of that sort, what percentage of foreign participation they will find acceptable. Now, I think it's very clear that they are not going to let uh, any foreign country uh, uh, or foreign corporation uh, have a controlling interest in any energy producing company or energy transporting. Now, instead, they would like to use their uh, their resources to gain control of the pipelines and and, and uh, particularly for energy supply in other countries. And this is one of the issues uh, that uh, that is behind the whole Ukrainian thing. And also they're putting pressure. They've more or less gotten control in Belarus now. And of course there is the uh, controversy uh, in Britain uh, over uh, the, the possible Russian uh, purchase of one of their uh, their natural gas distribution things. So yes, I would say Russia is sensitive, uh, and uh, Russia's actions are sensitive uh, in this sense. Uh, and but I I don't see that as you know acting any differently than than others have. Um, basically, most countries with a lot of resources particularly if they're poor, eventually do national, nationalize these resources. Uh, certainly, you know, Saudi Arabia, OPEC, they try to maintain control over the amount of production, and so on. Mexico, I think, has never denationalized theirs. Uh, I, I'm sure 
myself that uh, uh, that a sovereign government of Iraq is going in effect to nationalize, if not in name and practice, uh, the oil resources there. So uh, yeah, you point, I think, to something that is going to be an issue and is going to take a lot of management because most countries are going to be very sensitive uh, to foreign corporations coming in and particularly uh, their natural resources uh, gaining what they would think control. And I think that most will try to find ways to limit this to get the benefits of the foreign investment. Actually, right now, Russia has so much money, they don't need that much more foreign investment. They do need uh, a lot more training and management and, and so on. Uh, but their industries uh, are, you know, vary and their vulnerability to this. But uh, in most countries, basic transportation, like railways, airlines, uh, and um, uh, uh, in this country, obviously, ports, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, natural resource producers are obviously highly politically sensitive uh, when it comes to selling them uh, to foreign entities, whether they're international corporations or, or national ones. Great. Sir, Eugene Pite, uh, can you comment on the status of uh, non-Lugar uh, cooperative disarmament programs? Are they being properly funded by the U.S. Congress, and are they be being properly implemented? Yeah, the question is non-Lugar. Is it being properly funded and properly implemented? I think this sort of program can always uh, you know, use more funds. And I suspect that it would have been, in terms of, of nuclear security, uh, a, more, a little more effective if we had invested more of the money there than, than sourcing almost everything uh, in the United States. Although, politically, I think the latter was probably inevitable. Having said that, I think that, uh, on the whole, it has been a very successful program. Uh, and I, I think that we, so far, and we'll have to knock on wood, so far as we know, there has been no major diversion uh, uh, from Russia. Uh, the proliferation has occurred primarily from uh, Pakistan and North Korea, uh, and particularly Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but th those are important. I would say from now on, I think increasingly the limits are not the lack of money, but the feeling that the security interests of the two countries are diverging. And part of this comes from, I would say, a whole series of actions that were taken in the 90s and since that seem to ignore Russian interests and even ignore Russian national dignity. They looked at the expansion of NATO as an anti-Russian thing. They certainly looked at the way the Balkans was handled as anti-Russian. Uh, having been told that NATO was a defensive alliance, you have NATO without UN approving approval bombing Serbia, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, increasingly in, in these areas, particularly the professional Russian military, have decided that uh, uh, we are more an enemy than a friend. Now, under those circumstances, they are not going to allow nearly as much access as we would like to have. The other side of that is, while we went there with non-Lugar, we never made it reciprocal. And uh, when last year in a meeting uh, some of us had with President Putin and who was asked about, uh, you know, more access to some of their weapons programs, he said the access we will grant is, will be precisely the same as the access you grant us to your programs. And I think this is increasingly the problem. You really have to treat them as equals and, and with respect. And when you, when you treat them as wards, well, we've got to come and teach them and, and force them. You do develop, and particularly among the military, who can be very proud and particularly sensitive because they, they're in such sorry shape, you know. Uh, that, uh, and, uh, uh, the, so I think that is more important uh, in hampering the future of the program than the lack of money. Sir? No, go in the back. Yes, sir. Right there. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Speedy, Carnegie Corporation. Ambassador um, Markle, this builds on, on your point about the diverging of security interests since the 90s, and, and also to the, the observation that China will ultimately look to Europe instead of Asia. Speak, please, a little bit about the Shanghai Cooperation Council. I, 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 I just whether it's an organization with teeth that we should be concerned about Russia, as it was a member along with four of the five Central Asian states, China, uh, India, uh, Pakistan, and Iran, 
kind of states of concern are observers, I understand. So tell, uh, in, a, in the context of Russia looking to make alliances that may or may not be in our best interest, does this mean anything? I, I don't think it means very much. I think it's largely symbolical. Uh, one thing, the interests of these countries are, are so divergent in many respects. I don't think there's any way that can be used to say an anti-American alliance. And I think people that read it that way are certainly uh, uh, really misreading it. Now, there's no question that whether that Putin and the Chinese leaders and the others who signed it wanted to just to put up a little flag to say, hey, you know, you guys have are bragging that you can do it all by yourself. And of course, we'd like to have a few people, uh, you know, in a coalition of the willing when we want to do it, but we're going to decide what we do, and if you don't like it, uh, well, we're going to do it anyway. That was precisely the attitude that we went into Iraq. Now, you know, most people don't like this. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, you know, there is more potential tension between Russia and China, and when they have a, you know, a, a very major uh, problem of illegal immigration, they think, at least, uh, how much is illegal and not of uh, Chinese into the Russian Far East at the time that the Russian population is declining. They're very aware of the fact uh, of the population pressures that can really, you know, in, in, in a few decades, maybe take that whole area away from them, uh, uh, certainly ethically, if not uh, 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 politically. Uh, and there are many other uh, 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 things in the past of the countries, and the same is true uh, in Russian-Japanese relations, which are still plagued with the Northern Territories issue and others. However, I think all of them wanted to say, hey, you guys, uh, wake up. We've got options. And I think it was that much more than uh, the practicality. The fact, hard fact remains that they all can gain more from cooperating with the United States than by ganging up against the United States. And, and that's the hard fact when you get down to it. But just as in his energy policy and the others, I think Putin has been really very good in playing a hand from what was a very weak hand and putting them back on the map, and that's part of it. But I think it is more, you know, it is more appearance than it is the reality of, of an alliance that would give us any trouble. We've got time for one more question, I think, way in the back. Thank you. I'm Sandra Tesler, um, Ambassador in Scottish in the It's great to see you. I think you're nice. Uh, a few years back, Russia had um, some economic options that I think it should have to take. And one of them, uh, could you speak a little louder? I'm having a little trouble hearing. A few years back, I think that Russia had some economic <coughs> options that it chose not to take. And one of them was to develop a high-tech sector and to, um, in particular, capitalize on scientists and invest in um, computer science and, and high-tech. I think that that choice was not made essentially for political reasons because that would not have been compatible with a essentially uh, control, with control of uh, the economy by the government. I'm wondering whether you believe that it is sustainable for Russia for its long-term economic prosperity to essentially put all of its eggs in the basket of prosperity. I didn't catch the key. Is it, the last point was, is it economically viable for Russia to put all its eggs in the, oil, in the energy basket versus high tech? Did I get that right? That's right. Yeah. No, it isn't. Uh, I mean, you know, one can talk about all of the uh, the dangers of getting, you know, uh, um, you know, of the oil addiction. Um, obviously, uh, this, uh, in the long run, uh, can be Russia's Achilles' heel if they don't use this money well. Uh, Russia does have considerable potential in high tech, and their problem has been one more of management and organizing it uh, than actually creating it. You know, my, my friend uh, Tom Pickering told me recently that Boeing now hires 1,400 aeronautical engineers in Russia. In fact, it's Russian engineers who are really doing most of the design work on, on, on Boeing's new aircraft. Most Americans probably don't know that, but the, uh, the, there is a lot of there is a lot of technical expertise there, uh, which is being tapped by others rather than by Russians because their aircraft manufacturers are so poorly run. Uh, uh, these are long uh, stories. Now, on the other hand, obviously uh, the the income from the energy, uh, and I must say, uh, one of the problems in the past has been if, if when prices are up. Um, the money tends to be 
well, spent and dissipated, and then countries have a problem when the prices go down. I'm not sure that we're going to see such big fluctuations in the future, given the whole the fact that the Chinese and the Indians are, you know, increasing their uh, demand for uh, energy so rapidly. Uh, so we may see these high prices. And the thing is, I think Russia on the whole has used it fairly well in the sense they've paid down their debts. Uh, they've kept a, you know, a favorable balance of payments. Uh, now, uh, they, uh, they are using some for social purposes. Uh, Putin uh, faced widespread demonstrations early last year when he tried to uh, take away and monetize some of the privileges that the elderly and the disabled had. They demonstrated and he showed his flexibility. He's not, you know, he, he, he's smart enough to, 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 you know, say to back away if he runs into uh, a problem and he's using some of that oil to increase, you know, the, you might say the social fund uh, to improve pensions and, uh, and improve some of the welfare uh, things. Um, Obviously, so far, it has helped Russia. There's no question. Uh, I doubt if they're going to see $10 oil again, uh, uh, as uh, we got pretty close to. And uh, yeah, so um, now, um, obviously, it can lead to uneven development. Uh, but uh, I think th this is something that is going to be very hard uh, to predict. And my own observation has been in many areas uh, that uh, though the Russians have not been able to adapt quite as quickly as the Chinese to world markets in their manufacturing, uh, their, uh, much of their manufacturing, particularly in consumer goods, is, is really being improved very rapidly. And some of that is a result of foreign investment. Uh, outside, you know, the oil, the energy area, and maybe telecommunications, on the whole, foreign business is doing very well in Russia. Uh, the last meeting of the U.S.-Russian Trade and Economic Council, they reported it was their best ever. And I would say middle-level businesses, and many of them, particularly in the consumer goods field, are doing very well indeed. Um, some of the best performing uh, mutual funds recently have been those in Russian stocks. So um, uh, the, uh, the, so far as their, you know, uh, uh, so far as their overall income is concerned, obviously energy plays by far the dominant role. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to for some time. I think we really can't predict uh, to what degree, uh, you know, what all the implications will be internally. But so far, I think that, uh, you know, if they have a choice between uh, $70 oil or, or maybe $20 oil that would force them uh, to do some hard reforms, they will take the $70 <laughs> oil any day. <laughs> <All right. laughs>